It's my great pleasure as uh, Chairman of Wisbeach and Fenland Museum <coughs> to welcome um, our members and, of course, all the members of the Cambridgeshire Association for Local History to this uh, um, webinar this afternoon. Um, I, I'm, I am delighted to welcome you all, all here and, um, and, of course, our speaker, Professor James Wol uh, Wolvin. Uh, we're bringing this event to you as part of the programme of events through the Articles for Change project, which is funded by the Museums Association, the Esme Fairburns Collection Trust, and in partnership with the Cambridgeshire Association for Local History. Um, so, um, if the representative from uh, the Cambridgeshire Association would like to speak now, please. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm, as you know, standing in for Evelyn, who uh, isn't able to join us. Um, I'm the secretary of the Cambridge Association for Local History, and uh, it gives us very great pleasure to be associated with this event. We, uh, we're very fond of the um, Wisbeach and Penland Museum, and uh, we watch its progress uh, with a great deal of interest, uh, particularly over the past few difficult years. And we're simply delighted to be co-sponsoring this event with the museum. So uh, we're looking forward now to hear what uh, Professor Walvin is going to say. So I can hand over to you, sir. Thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you, first of all, for the invitation. And um, thank you for all of you who signed in, plugged in wherever you are in the um, east of England. Uh, I'm sitting in my study in, in, in York, in the north. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, um, and it's a very good time to talk about the subject, isn't it? About um, slavery, about Clarkson, about his work uh, in and around Wisbeach and more broadly across the United Kingdom in the campaign that uh, he was such a sort of important figure in, uh, particularly against the slave trade. Um, but if you think of it at the moment, it, if those of us who've been working on slavery for a long time uh, sometimes have to pinch ourselves to realize just how much slavery is in the air at the moment you you, you can hardly if you take if you take the guardian there's almost every single day there's something about slavery or slavery related issues um those of us who worked on it for a long time you know we, for years and years it was as if we were talking to ourselves you know there were very few people around specialist scholars both sides of the atlantic but now everyone has a view about slavery it's it's come center stage in ways in a way that none of us could have predicted um, now, that's particularly true, of course, since May 2020, since the, the dreadful killing of George Floyd and the extraordinary explosion of anger that uh, swept across the United States and the United Kingdom and elsewhere, I mean, really right around the world uh, in the wake of that killing. Um, but, and it, but it tapped into other issues that um, I don't want to go into, but we're all very familiar with. And what it did was to project to centre stage the question of uh, what role has slavery played in the kind of world that we live in? This is not a subject like the medieval wool trade or, um, I don't know, the War of the Roses, where people are, have very few invested interests. This is something that people have very sensitive feelings about the here and now. There are millions of people who feel that because they are descended from enslaved people, that uh, this is something that has a kind of sensitivity. And it touches raw nerves in a way that very few historical topics do. Now, that, what, that's not been the case, really, until very recently. The, the, the sensitivities have been a problem, but it's not been, the public has not been aware of it as a kind of major issue. Slavery is everywhere, and, it, and, it's, and it's, it's, it's embraced so many institutions in this country, uh, right down to Parliament. I mean, Parliament's had to pass a new act about defacing statues, for instance. Parliament's been brought again into an engagement with the whole question of slavery. Um, if you consider the kind of, institutional links that have cropped up recently um, on the back of the, the slave question. Um, Oxford Colleges, All Souls College, Oxford, with its um, library uh, named after a famous um, Barbadian slave owner. Um, uh, individual companies that uh, have roots in a slave past. Um, banks, insurance companies that have made money from um, slavery in, in the years before 1830s when the British abolished slavery. And even royalty, I mean, think the Royal African Company, the company that was set up to provide Africans for the plantations of the Americas. It was a royal company. It had investors and royalty. The Duke of York, later the, uh, James II, the Duke of York, 
uh, had an, a big investments in the Royal African Company, and in fact uh, would brand his own particular slaves D Y on their shoulder. Now, the question of, the ro of royalty and slavery in the slave trade has been something that people have steered clear from for all kinds of obvious reasons. But wherever you turn, institutions have become involved in the argument about Britain and its involvement with slavery. As I said, the simple truth is that slavery is everywhere. You simply can't escape it. And that's true, I think, of British history, let's say post-1650. Uh, in the years after 1650, slavery is a, a major institution, an increasingly important institution in the way Britain evolves. Britain, the British Empire, and the rise of British power and wealth from the mid-17th century go hand in hand with the emergence and rise of African slavery in the Americas. And I'll return to the question about the numbers in just a second. And my basic point then is that slavery is part of the warp and the weft of British history in a way that historians have recognized for a very long time, but is now only becoming accepted or contested uh, by uh, the public at large. One of the problems about um, the debate that's taken place this last 15 months or so uh, last 12 months particularly, about slavery and in Britain has been that it's really been related to elite institutions. People have been interested in which stately home owes its foundations to the slave past, which great uh, holders of land uh, dabbled in slavery, which rich families, which rich companies. But the point about slavery is that you need to look beyond the wealthy institutions, the elite institutions. Slavery and involves tens of thousands of British people in doing ordinary things. Um, how many thousands of men, we actually do have numbers, but how many thousands of men worked on the slave ships? There are thousands of slave ships plying their trade between Europe, West Africa, the Americas and back. What becomes known uh, as the triangular trade, it's actually not triangular, but we'll, I'll turn to that in a second. How many thousands of men were ordinary men, rough men, the roughest end of British society? You listen to the words of John Newton, the great hymn writer, talking about the crew members. He's talking about the dregs of society. Tens of thousands of men drawn into work on the slave, on the slave ships crossing the Atlantic. Um, think of the people who um, worked on those ships, not merely as sailors, but who built the ship, the shipbuilding industries, who, who serviced those ships. Think of the products which those uh, ships brought back to this country the tobacco, the sugar, the rum, the cotton, and the, and way the, and the way those uh, commodities were processed once they'd arrived back in Britain, employing tens of thousands of people. Now, what you're looking at there, if once you get behind elite institutions, you're looking at masses of people and large numbers of objects, of things, commodities in this case. Slaves in the Americas produce commodities for the Western world. And it's when we begin to look at those commodities that you begin, you can actually tease out the real story of what slavery was like. And there's no better place to start, of course, than Thomas Clarkson. And it, it, it's no accident that Thomas Clarkson's famous African chest uh, is a good starting point. It's a centerpiece of the museum at, at Wiz Beach. It's also a center point for understanding what he was trying to say about the slave trade and about the campaign against it. He hauled that chest tens of thousands of miles. He was the kind of dogged, foot soldier of the abolition movement from the 1780s onwards, uh, crisscrossing the country tirelessly, picking up information, interviewing men on the slave ships, gathering commodities which he found from the slave ships, assembling them in his African chest and making the point, here are goods which are produced in other parts of the world, which Britain can actually trade for in return for our goods without involving ourselves in African humanity. His basic point was, and it was exemplified by the chest, is that we can have normal trade with Africa. They produce cotton, there's, there's uh, timber, there are seeds, there are oils, there are any number of leather goods, there are any number of items that you could trade to and from Africa with and avoid trading in humanity. What he was trying to say, and what others picked up later, and the man that picked it up following him immediately after 1789 was Equiano, the African, is that the British and others should set aside trading in humanity and develop a normal free trade with West Africa. Now, that was an extraordinary uh, leap in the dark because the slave trade by then, by 1780s, had become so important, so central, that people simply couldn't imagine 
life without it. I'll return to this again in a second, that what's strange and what is very difficult to, to teach and to get students to understand is that most of the people we're talking about, the slave traders, the merchants in Liverpool in Bristol, the merchants in Brazil, uh, in Providence, Rhode Island, are in, involved in a trade which they think is morally neutral. They're not, it's not something that they have moral or religious uh, sensibilities about. The best example of this, and I've just been reading only this morning, um, in 1753-54, John Newton, slave captain, sits at Sandy Point in St. Kitts, getting rid of a cargo of Africans, talking to another slave captain about theology. And night after night, these two men sit there discussing their Christian faith with the stink of the slave ships around them and not thinking that there's any kind of incongruity about what they do, not thinking there's a, a, a friction between the immorality of slavery and the slave trade and their theology. There's no inconsistency. But of course, if you want to go down that road, uh, you only have to look at the, the mid 20th century to see that there are large numbers of educated, religious, sophisticated people in Europe who will spend the day reading Goethe or listening to Mozart and reading the Bible and blow the brains out of Jews in the forests of Eastern Poland uh, the next working day. You know, that, that, that apparent incongruity between daily life and firm, sophisticated religious belief is something that is not peculiar to the world of slavery. Now, when Clarkson was collecting items, particularly in Liverpool, collecting goods from the slave ships from Africa, he um, was working in a city that a visiting city that had become the center of uh, the British Atlantic slave trade. By the late 18th century, something like one African in five crosses the Atlantic in a ship from Liverpool. Now, there are two great slave trading systems, one in the South Atlantic, which is a direct link between Brazil and West Africa. It crisscrosses directly east to west. And the other one is the one that services the Caribbean and North, Af North America. And that's the one that we think of as the triangular trade. But um, Liverpool is the center of um, the North Atlantic trade and the Liverpool ships come to dominate the trade in shipping Africans to the Americas. And it's there that Clarkson begins to collect goods and items, artifacts, things that can, he can parade around the country and persuade people that there are other, other ways of trading other than slavery, other than the humanity of Africa. And what that does, of course, is raise the whole question of Liverpool Liverpool was redolent uh, with slavery in the late 18th century. And of course, you can still see it to this day. I mean, the warehouses, uh, the sugar refineries, they're now something else, the street names. Um, uh, you cannot think of Liverpool without thinking of its emergence in the 18th century as um, the centre of uh, the British slave trade. Think of the other commodities. Liverpool becomes the centre for shipping Africans that were producing sugar, but in the 19th century, they're producing something else. Of course, the goods that are coming into Liverpool via slave labour is, is uh, cotton. And I'll return to that in just one second. Let me digress and try to illustrate a point by a slightly autobiographical question. I was born and raised in North Manchester in a little place called Failsworth, which is between Manchester and Oldham. And I spent most of my spare time with my grandparents in Oldham. And it, in the 1940s, 1950s, and one of my favourite spots behind the house I lived in was um, I used to stand and do a, a circular tour and try to count the number of factory chimneys. We were hemmed in by factories and hemmed in by factory chimneys. And all of them, almost all of them, were textile factories. All of them were producing or working with cotton, with textiles of some kind or other, or in industries that were related to the Lancashire textile industry. One side of my grandparents were, uh, were cotton workers, cotton mill workers, and you, they could never escape that oily smell of um, the, the oil in the, um, in, in, the, in the cotton they worked in the old. And, and the other side were, were miners who worked in, on the Lancashire coal field. Uh, now, the interesting thing about all this is that I was a, a young kid interested in history, looking at these various factories. And I, what, what prompted my interest was the emergence of an English working class, which is what I did my PhD on. And that's what I thought about the, those factories meant. But of course, what, they meant something else as well, because they were all working with cotton. And where did that cotton come from? Well, before 1860, that cotton came from the US South. And it came across the Atlantic to Liverpool, 
and it then entered the uh, Lancashire textile industry as raw materials and shipped out of Liverpool as finished textiles. And it was grown, of course, before 1860 by enslaved Africans in the American South. I, you look around you, uh, I looked around me in North Manchester uh, in the 40s and 50s, and it, the penny never dropped. The penny didn't drop. That What I was looking at was evidence of slavery. The textile industry grew to its extraordinary position by the mid 19th century on the back of African-American labor in the US South. Now, if you want an illustration of this, look at the, um, the coat of arms of the city of Manchester, which was, uh, the city was incorporated, I think in 1842. And if you look at that coat of arms, it's actually, it's, it, you see it almost every other day on television, on the, the shirts of the two football teams. What you see on it is um, a sailing ship. If, if you look at it closely, the coat of arms has a B on it. The B, of course, is um, busy. This is an area that prides itself on an industry and working hard. Uh, but it has a sailing ship. Now, why would an inland city, Manchester's 30 odd miles from the coast, why would it have a sailing ship? Well, that sailing ship was a representation of, of the heart, uh, the lifeblood of Manchester. And that is, cotton in, textiles out. That's a, an illustration of the sailing ship of the very fact I've just been talking about, and that is that Manchester thrives on the importation of goods, cotton, and the export of finished textiles. But when you look at that coat of arms, and when you look at the skyline, it, the skyline is different now, of course, but when you look at the remnants of those factories, I mean, who thinks about the slaves that may be possible? There are any number of ways in which you can get to the story of slavery by looking at things, by looking at objects, by looking at a landscape in this case, by looking at a, um, a coat of arms. Uh, think of the British addiction to tea. Friends of mine say I've got a, an obsession about this and I must stop talking about it, but it actually is a very good way into it. You think of the, the British uh, obsession with tea. It's, it's be, to Americanize, it's a kind of caricature of, of the Brits, isn't it? A sweet cup of tea. It's tea in the 18th century. The tea comes not from India, where there is no tea. It comes from China. And it's mixed with what? It's mixed with sugar grown by whom? Grown by African slaves in Jamaica and Barbados. Now, think of that for a second. By the late 18th century, the British are addicted uh, on a national scale, rich and poor alike, to sweet tea. But the tea is from Asia, from the far end of the trading routes to China. The sugar comes from the Americas, where it's cultivated by Africans. Now, what you're looking at there, in one single commodity, sweet tea, what you're looking at is the story of a, a global story of trade. You're looking at, it's not a triangular trade. The Atlantic trade is triangular in places, but you're looking at slavery being at the, he the center of a quite extraordinary global hub. And you can see this actually, if you, look, if you go around a stately home, or many museums, and you find 18th century collections of porcelain, of, of, of Dresden, of Meissen, of Wedgwood, of Worcester, or whatever it might be. Um, and in the middle there, you'll find a sugar bowl. The Chinese porcelain in industry that poured out hundreds of thousands of items to ship to Europe in the 18th century, invented a sugar bowl. The Chinese drank their tea without sugar. They didn't drink it with cane sugar, but the Europeans, and particularly the British did. So the Chinese potters in their great porcelain kilns produced sugar bowls, especially for the European market. And that gives you a really interesting clue. So that next time you go to a stately home and see an 18th century tea set or a coffee set, think of that. That sugar is there because of the Africans in the Americas. Think of the United States. The United States in the, in the 19th century becomes an extraordinary consumer of coffee. You know, the Americans consume coffee all the time. All my American friends have coffee on the go all the time. It's, uh, it's a way of life, a way that tea is with us. Now, that coffee becomes a, an extraordinary commodity in the United States in the 19th century, and it's grown by whom? It's grown by slaves in Brazil. And it's mixed with what? It's mixed with sugar grown by slaves in Cuba. You can't understand the American uh, relationship to Cuba right down to the present day unless you remember the way uh, Cuba and uh, the United States evolved together economically on the back of uh, the Cuban sugar industry in the 19th century. So coffee in Brazil, sugar in Cuba. 
both cultivated by slaves. Remember that Brazil and Cuba don't end their slavery until the 1880s. This is just within spitting distance of the modern world. This is it, it, Slavery ends in Brazil and Cuba at the point that my grandparents are born. That's how close it is to us. This is not something that's in the distant past. So there are three drinks, aren't there? Um, tea, coffee, and chocolate that become palatable to the West by the mixture of sugar. Now, if you think of it, tea from China, uh, chocolate from Mexico originally, coffee from the Horn of Africa, not consumed uh, with the addition of sugar in their native region, but are transformed by the European and North American addition of sugar grown by African slaves. And what lies up behind all that, of course, is the extraordinary story of the Atlantic slave trade. I don't want to get bogged down in the story of the numbers, but the numbers are important. And we now know that uh, slightly more than 12 million Africans are loaded onto the uh, Atlantic slave ships. A an enormous number of people. We know that more than 11 million people die, uh, more than 11 million people survive, uh, but that leaves more than a million who don't survive. Um, the crossings across the Atlantic are dotted by African corpses thrown overboard. And the sharks actually get wise to this. It's a, it's a story that all the slave trade captains tell of their ships being surrounded by sharks off the coast of Africa in the Atlantic. And then when they land in tropical Americas, in the West Indies and, and Brazil, sharks circling, circling the ships, waiting for the corpses of Africans to be ditched overboard. Um, the slave trade makes all this possible. The question is, why, why import millions of Africans on a treacherous, dangerous, deadly voyage, uh, why not grow sugar or whatever, tobacco? Why not grow in Africa? Well, of course, the problem with Africa is that the white man can't survive there. Not until the late 19th century is the white man really able to live and work safely in Africa because of tropical diseases. It's not until the emergence of tropical medicine in the late 19th century that makes Africa safer for Europeans to live there. But what emerges is this an extraordinary movement of people, the largest enforced movement of people, the slave trade in the Atlantic, until the Second World War. Think of it like that. And that, of course, in the 17th, 18th century, at a time when the world's population is much, much smaller than it is today. This is a, an extraordinary movement of people. And it's also an extraordinary uh, experience of suffering. Uh, I, I won't go into the details of the life on board the slave ships. You could smell them five, seven miles downwind. Uh, it was a gross experience which every survivor who stepped to foot, stepped ashore in the Americas, never forgot. Large numbers didn't survive, but those who did survive never forgot it. I mentioned that if you're going around a museum, look at um, uh, the porcelain collections. One other way in, in, in which you might think of it is um, looking at, look at the furniture. And again, this is true of almost any um, old house. I've got some in my old house, my own house here in York. Um, if you go to one place in Yorkshire, it's only 30 minutes drive, 40 minutes drive where I'm speaking now, the Harwood House, famous now uh, for um, being a place that made, became what it is really on the back of slavery in, uh, in the Caribbean. The Lascelles family were small Yorkshire farmers until they involve themselves in trading to and from Barbados and Jamaica, eventually become moneylenders, eventually become planters. When they freed their slaves, along with everybody else in the 1830s, they received £26,000 compensation paid by British taxpayer, a uh, huge amount of money, something like the equivalent of 3.3 million today. Howard House is famous for this now, but if you wander around that, extra, it's a wonderful, beautiful place. They have this extraordinary state dining room, which is Chippendale, it's this most wonderful collection of furniture built for the place itself by Chippendale. Now it's all mahogany furniture. Uh, that mahogany came from the Caribbean. It came from the Mosquito Coast. Mahogany furniture becomes a fashionable item after about 1720 when the taxation on timber changes. And it, it's ideal hardwood for craftsmen. Mahogany furniture becomes a fashionable thing to have. Now the odd thing is that it's an industry in, in England that grows out of Lancaster. Who associates Lancaster with the slave trade in Africans? We know of 122 voyages that start from Lancaster 
and uh, voyages that ship something like 20,000 Africans into the America. They don't concentrate uniquely on bringing mahogany back, but increasingly, as mahogany takes over, and as the Gillows, who eventually have a, an office, a shop in Oxford Street, the Gillow Archive, which is still extraordinarily important, uh, the Gillows develop an industry of their own in and around um, Lancaster. And from that emerges this quite extraordinary story of craftsmen fanning out around Britain to create these beautiful artifacts. But who thinks of the mahogany being related to slavery? That wood, mahogany, is logged, dragged down from the center of the rainforests of Mosquito Coast, Belize and Honduras now, and Cuba, down to the waterside, and is shipped as planks or as hardwood, uh, chunks of hardwood, to Lancaster and other parts of the, uh, and, uh, and also onto North America for craftsmen to use there. The difficulty is, of course, when you go around the stately home, when you visit Harwood House and the Met, uh, you look at these kind of extraordinary, splendid surroundings. I mean, Harwood's got this wonderful, these gardens, Chip Capability Brown, you've got this wonderful furnishing, major collection of art. Um, who thinks of slavery? Who thinks that this is somehow or other related to slavery? Well, it was. Now, the interesting thing about the, the acquisition of Africans as enslaved labor is that the sh all the ships that leave Liverpool, Bristol, anywhere else, particularly Rio. Rio is the greatest port shipping out from the Americas to Africa for enslaved labor. Um, those ships leave their home ports loaded with commodities to exchange for Africans. The British trade is dominated by one particular item. The item that uh, is shipped in greatest volumes to West Africa in return for Africans are textiles. And the interesting feature about that is not British textiles, the largest proportion of those textiles for a long time were from India. When the Europeans, the Portuguese, then the Dutch, when the Portuguese first land in India, they discover this extraordinary Indian textile industry, advanced, more sophisticated, more complex than anything that the Europeans had. The, the Europeans very quickly start to copy what the Indians were producing. But for the best part of two, three hundred years, the textiles that were shipped into West Africa to exchange for African slaves came from India. Think of it for a minute. You've got textiles shipped from India across the Indian Ocean. The ships sailed clean across the South Atlantic before catching the winds back across the North Atlantic, then down to West Africa, where it's exchanged for African slave labor. Textiles from India being exchanged in West Africa for labor that is then shipped to the Americas. This is a global trade. One other item, or the other point I should make about that is that when the Lancashire textile industry, the industry that my dear old grandparents spent their life sweating in, when the Lancashire textile industry cottoned on, that's a good phrase, isn't it? Cottoned on to what the Indians were producing, they began to copy it. They began to copy and pretend that their textiles were Indian. They copied the colors, they copied the designs, they copied the names. The Brits have copied this extraordinary, sophisticated textile industry in order to produce more slaves for the Americas. One other item that the Europeans are using, enormous volumes to acquire Africans, were cowrie shells. Those beautiful little seashells that are very popular amongst African-American women in the Caribbean, well, all over the world, really, as, as hair adornment, as bracelets, part of their clothing. Those cowrie shells are shipped in their millions and millions, and they're shipped from the Maldives to West Africa. If you look at the back of some uh, Ghanaian coins, they, ha they have it on there, uh, an image for a cowrie shell. The cowrie shell is a kind of means of exchange. It's like a coin. Um, and they're shipped in the millions in sacks and in barrels from the Maldives to India to Europe, then down to West Africa. But who would... Who could possibly imagine this? And a, a very lovely little item from the old, in the middle of the Indian Ocean becomes central to the way Europeans do their trade in West Africa for Africans to labor in the Americas. Now, as I say, those carries today are items of adornment. But standing back from it, who would imagine that the carry has got anything to do with the slave trade? And yet once you look at it, begin to tease it apart, tease its story apart, 
you end up in the world of slavery. Now, there are other items that we could go in, I could go on about. I mean, more, the most obvious one would be firearms, huge, huge volumes of firearms. Birmingham thrives on the extraordinary explosion of um, guns, explosion of guns uh, um, uh, produced to send to Africa. It's an extraordinary trade. All of this really is by way of illustrating the point that Thomas Clarkson himself was making, and that is that if you look at objects, you look at things, you can actually and begin to sort of tap away at their surface, ask what is the industry, what's the story, what's the, the history behind this object, you'll end up looking at slavery. What you're looking at also is an industry, a slave trade and slavery in the Americas, that looks on the surface and is often described as a triangular trade, but it's much more complicated than that. You've got goods and people shifting back and forth, not merely around the Atlantic, from east to west and west to east, but from the far reaches of Asia into Europe and thence to Africa, thence to the Americas. It even reaches, the story of slavery even reaches the unexplored frontiers of North America. The Europeans use rum as a means of seducing the Indian peoples of North America, Canada, what becomes the United States, and in, in the Southern Hemisphere, seducing them via alcohol to sign treaties, to give away their land, to conquer them. Rum, it, 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 you see this in the cowboy movies, don't you, of Indians getting drunk with, um, with uh, fire water, with whiskey. Well, long before whiskey, it was rum that had been uh, distilled and processed in North America from the sugar that was imported from the Caribbean. It's slave-produced commodity, which even begins to seduce the Indian peoples of North America. If you really want the story of slavery, it's not a triangular trade. It's not a trade that concerns uh, just Africa, Europe, and America. It's something that actually draws in people on a global scale. The really big final question, and from the British point of view, is not merely that slavery is central to the way Britain emerged in the 17th, 18th century, but why does it end? If it is so important, if it is so valuable, why do the Brits end it? As they do in 1807, the slave trade, 1833 with slavery. And remember, in 1833, they set aside £20 million to compensate not the slaves, but the slave owners. Hence, the current argument about reparations. People saying, if you could compensate the slave owners, how about us? How about my great great grand great great grandfather etc. In all of this, the state is central. You can't really understand the nature of the British state or the French state or the Spanish or the Portuguese state without understanding their entanglement with slavery. This is not just a few privateers in Liverpool and Bristol. The Royal Navy is central to in imposing law and order on this. The Africans are terrified of warships and the guns that they carry. Africans are intimidated by it, and they're kept in their place by the Royal Navy in the 18th century, shipping arms around the Caribbean. All of this is to illustrate that slavery was once a kind of uh, esoteric topic. A few of us talked to each other about it. Now it's center stage. And the reason it's center stage is because it is so central to the way we were and increasingly obvious to the way we are. Thank you.